right? It's not the quantitative. It's not about just trying to make money. It's about the story. It's about the feel. It's about who you are. That if it's pink, it's pink. Um, I think Dan hit it on the head. If it's pink and it's you, yeah. then do it. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my two colleagues, Dan Weiss and Nathaniel Leach. And today we have a guest, Alex Shrimp. We're really, really excited to have Alex. He is the founder of Auto Handler, and we are going to talk about buying um, exotic or luxury cars, which is really exciting because a lot of our clients always have questions about this specific subject. So we're going to get into the details. Before we get there, I want to introduce Alex through his bio, just so our listeners can have a good understanding of who we're speaking with. So Alex Shrimp has over 34 years of experience in the auto industry with a passion and a knowledge of highly collectible classic luxury and sports cars. Alex has consulted with thousands of clients with regard to procurement, consignment, disposition, and maintenance of almost every kind of new and pre-owned car, from a simple used $5,000 car for your child's first car to the highest end Porsches, Ferraris, Aston Martins, McLarens, and more. Alex very much enjoys the satisfaction of providing an excellent service, whether it be working through an issue as a client's advocate or providing his black glove concierge service. Alex, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That's actually, uh, it sounded pretty good. Like I almost wrote it or something. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Nathaniel. I think he's going to start us off today with some questions and I was really excited to have the combo. Can you tell us a little bit more about what, how you would define what Auto Handler does and how you got started in the business? And then we can go from there. Sure. So currently, so Auto Handler has kind of uh, morphed into this business that I've had for about eight years now. You know, so it, I, I, I felt myself, well, how can I provide a, a, I, I know I wrote black glove service in my bio, which is funny. I changed that later on to white glove service because I thought it was like, oh God, what's black gloves? But uh, but it's basically what that's uh, the concept is basically a hands-on, but without being too hands-on. So you can, when you, when you contact me, I'm a pretty much a one-man operation. So I have a service shop that, you know, I actually oversee and a showroom and uh, we do, we handle everything, um, any, anything in your automotive needs, if it, whether you can text me and on a Saturday or a Sunday with a question and I'm there for the answer for you, which I think a lot of people like. Um, and I, and I handle their whole family's vehicles in a lot of cases because they just really don't, they don't like the experience of going into the brick and mortar as beautiful as they're making them these days. It can be intimidating for some, uh, for others, it can be, uh, just, they just don't enjoy it and they never have. Um, and others, they just want one person to give them the answer. Um, in, on, on, like say that I've got clients that have 20 or 30 different cars and different makes and models of different generations. And they just want one person to be able to go to, to give them an answer on something and not have to research that an answer for that car with a whole bunch of different people. That, that was great. That, that really hit on what was going to be my next uh, follow-up question, which is kind of what's the general process, but you kind of just answer that, which is great. Sure. So then moving on to, to the, my next question, it's going to be more of a, a two-parter. So uh, in, in going back and forth in the email communication prior to this podcast and in conversation before we started recording, it came up about uh, most, the two parts of this. So first, what are the most important factors in buying a luxury vehicle? And then in that back and forth, there was mentioned about all these different types of, I'm, I, forgive me, I'm not a car person, but you, you mentioned such things as basic luxury, exotics, electric, classics and collections, bespoke. What, what do all those terms really 
mean and how do they factor into buying terms or types of cars? I don't even know. What, how do they factor into buying a luxury vehicle with you? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, those are just different segments of vehicles. Uh, you know, everybody has a need, whether it's their first vehicle foray into an exotic car, or um, maybe they're start decided that they want to build a collection of vehicles, or maybe they've already had a collection and it's, it's growing to the point where they'd like to have somebody help them manage that collection. Um, so, you know, in Bespoke, you know, we've done, a, we've helped people with that. There, you may, there was a person that I want a very special one-off situation. You know, I want my car to be unlike any other car. You know, I can't, you don't want to drive up to the school or the store or whatever, the mall or whatever. And I want my car to stand out. Um, it makes me feel good to do that. And that's, and that's what, that's, it's, it's all, it's a feeling. So I, I would say more than anything, um, more than a need or a want if that, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's a feeling you want to experience. Um, that would be, the, I guess, the best way to answer. And how they end up in my, you know, situation is typically they know what they kind of are looking for when they come in, whether it be a 1964, you know, 911 or you know, first one, first year of that car that was ever produced. At that, or actually, they called it the 901 back then, uh, before they, they were shut down on that name, and it became the 911. But, you know, or a, is something as much as, a, a, you know, a newer Ferrari, you know, that you know, they can ask, they have concerns a lot of time about maintenance and, you know, the cost of that and when the year cutoffs or when things became less maintenance centric on some of these exotic type vehicles. And, and uh, I can kind of point them in the right direction when it comes to that. Okay. So most kind important factors. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I forgot the first phase one. So back on that phase one was. I'd say most important, on, if you're just looking for mainstream luxury vehicles, and I would call that like uh, you know, Lexus or Mercedes or BMW or Audi or whatever that is. Um, I think the most important thing in purchasing it is just uh, what, what is important? Number one, what are your top priorities? Are you important? You know, what's important to you? Uh, for instance, I live in Wisconsin, you know, in, in southern Wisconsin, which is an odd place for me to have this business. And everybody says that to me all the time, but I know people from all over the world. But, you know, it's like, well, how did you end up in Wisconsin? But that's another story for another time. So, but our area, the, you, you know, it's interesting that like Mercedes Benz, for example, will outsell um, most luxury brands, uh, mainstream luxury brands, most places if you go to a major metro. Um, but here, Audi is the, you know, key. Okay. And, uh, and it's because we were in a college campus, a little bit, cons you know, we're liberally conservative, you know, I don't, it's not as much of a look at me type vehicles. This, I call it the chicken foot on the hood. Don't get consulted Mercedes owners, but that's, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's like it, it, that's got, you know, they don't want, they don't want that image. They want a different, more like a constrained image. So that's where Audi's been very successful in this area. So um, I would say, what's the most important thing? It's really how it makes you feel, I think, and how, uh, and, and two, off that, is it going to get, is, is there function that's important to you? You know, that's different for every person. So what the function is, you know, do I need to haul family with me when I do this? Am I, do I like to entertain? Do I, do I go out uh, with another, we go out often with another couple? Is it just me and my significant other and we want to go out together and we just need two seats? You know, so, so it's, there's a lot of, it's, it's hard to really pin that one thing down what the most important thing is. So Alex, I'm curious, you know, you kind of talked a little bit about your, the process with your clientele, but what I'm, I'm really curious about is what is your process on the back end to get these deals done? done <laughs> yeah like that's what do you, you hire, go... that's why you have to hire me to do it <laughs> exactly so. that's what i'm curious about what, what does it take so, and maybe and don't give up your secret sauce but i'm just no, curious no, on no, what no, it no, takes no, to okay. get these things no no, no 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 give up your secret sauce give that up <laughs> yeah yeah let's hear it so yeah I'll, I'll give up the secret a little bit of the secret sauce but you, you're not gonna be able to use the secret sauce because you have to have you have to have to know how, you have to really act like i shouldn't say you're not gonna be able to some people can but so it's uh it's it's really being able to cut to the chase and knowing the language of the business 
and uh, if that makes sense, um, knowing where to look to, you know, that helps and having contacts, um, a lot of contacts. That's the secret sauce and being able to get, get people what they want. Um, and it's also what, what they're willing to spend to get it. You know, a lot of the time, especially right now in this market, this current COVID market, it's, it's, it's a struggle to get to be, get vehicles right now. Um, especially, especially when you get into a uh, finite, um, you know, you know, you know, down the colors and combinations and, you know, and the models and things like that. They're just, they're, there's a low amount of inventory, but I'm able to, as a dealer, ha- holding a dealer's license and with the experience that I've got and people can Google me in two seconds and figure out that who I am probably. And, you know, most people could. And, and so I can just call the, basically call the general manager, cut through all that levels of, of uh, frustration, you know, and, and I can get answers usually in minutes versus they want you to go through what they call the 10 steps of selling a car. So, which is come on in, sit down in it, have a cup of coffee. Let's go for a drive. You know, you know, what's your kids' names? You know, you know, but that's not how society works these days. That is how society worked back in the, you know, eighties, nineties. And, you know, it's not how it works these days. So you really got to tailor make it to the individual. And that's what I'm about. So, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you want to be sold a car? Not just, sell you a car. Uh, speaking of tailoring to the individual, I think when we were talking last a couple months back, you were in the process of, I, if, I, if I recall correctly, shipping a Ferrari to, I think it was South Africa. Is that right, Alex? Oh, Ghana. Ghana? 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 Yeah. Ghana. Okay, so, Ghana. so the Africa. I don't know if it was, uh, yeah, it might have been a Mercedes. It was a Mercedes, well, okay. Yeah, it's bringing them into the country that's more difficult. Exiting the via country is not that mm-hmm. big of a deal. Yeah, so um, so it, really, I leave it. I give them a couple contacts, and I leave it. On, I leave the shipping on the that end. So it, that, that's a smart way to do it. And I would recommend that if your folks are looking at selling vehicles, there's all and if they're doing that on their own, there are there's a lot of hurdles that I would say be very careful with. And um, you know, where the handling of funds and things like that. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of deception in this world. So um, I would I would check in with somebody that has a lot of experience doing that. And I'm happy to help with that. But um, it's a finish on that question. Yeah, basically, I've got three or four international shippers, and I kind of give them a choice. And I hey, contact this person at this company to arrange your shipping, uh, you know, and customs and all that stuff, and, and your um, VAT taxes and everything like that that are necessary to bring the car into that country we get a lot and i'm guessing that you hear this sometimes too of getting the best bang for your buck and i know in such a custom-made process that's tough to talk about but could you shed any light typically speaking if there are genres of cars or specific brands or, or even specific models that you tend to find just give give what your clients are looking for the best bang for their buck from a value standpoint and from a resale standpoint. Okay. So, yeah. So, and again, this will go, this will depend upon varying degrees of what they're interested in purchasing. So, so if it's a new luxury mainstream car, or if it's a new exotic car, or if it's a classic vehicle um, and what they're, and what is their, what are their goals? What are are their goals uh, everyday use or their goals going to be, uh, hold and um, for hopeful potential increase in value to cash out someday or, you know, uh, you know, or some degree in between. So I would say, um, let's start on that ladder one first. So classic type vehicles, if you're looking to, it it is like a, so think of it like this. I'll give you an example. So Porsches, air-cooled Porsches, went just crazy and probably from 2013 through 20 i'd say 17 um you know they just went oh there's a bubble that just burnt you know just crazy because that car uh an air cool port is backing up is basically 1998 and prior before they became water cooled 
Um, and then even earlier, long, what they call long hood or early Porsche 911s would be like the early 70s. So 73 and, and the Porsche 911 first came out in 1964, 65. So, so, so those, those were cars that were very aspirational for people. And maybe they didn't have, they weren't a part in, in, in their life where they could afford that vehicle. And then when they became into the, you know, having funds to be able to perform on something, the, you know, the sentimental in themselves decides to go and research and that's what they wanted. So that really bumps the value of those vehicles out. So me, as a person that's trying to make an income, if I, you know, back, you know, I, you know, if I'm speculating, if I'm looking to purchase something for an investment purpose, but still have some fun use out of it, I basically look at that cycle. Okay, so so what what it, so it's about a what a twenty five year cycle. So let's let's look at twenty five years ago. What some what was the hot thing that everybody wanted and couldn't afford? Okay, and then and then and then go back and okay, and sometimes it can be like really an obscure weird car. Now we're getting into the eighties now, guys, and the eighties sucked for cars. They were just not. I mean, everything was plastic. It was horrible. I mean, there's a couple cars, and I've owned them all. You know, they were. You know, I've got a Grand National, Buick Grand National. It's probably one of the coolest cars in the 80s. It's sitting in the showroom right now. It's sold in 24 hours. So so um, I had a uh, GMC Cyclone, you know, which is the pickup truck hot rod, you know, and Carter was was like the fastest car on the planet, beat everything, including the Ferraris. Um, so, and they only made like so many of those. So those are cars that if you can find them for a good deal and hold them, might go up in value. Now, caveat to that is that is going to, I hate to say it, it's kind of a little bit of a dying thing, dying market. So you get younger folks are just more into technology and not as much into burning dead dinosaurs. And, you know, it's, 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 it's getting, you know, it's getting a little bit, it, it, it's, you know, it's not going to be as exciting for some, you, you, the crowd, the crowd is shrinking. So um, I see the market shrinking a little bit. And then, then people are using, um, there's more ride share stuff. There's more things going on in that market. Um, you know, Amazon's going to have a car. So is Apple. So is every, you know, everybody's going to, you know, they're going to reinvent just like they reinvented the phone, the camera and everything else. It's going to be, it's going to be reinvented. It's just such a big thing right now. Not one company can get their hands around it quite yet. So to answer your question, I think, uh, yeah, from the classic standpoint, 25 year cycle, go look at something kind of cool. It's like, hey, that might be a good idea. That might be the next big thing. It's taking a gamble, but you know, if you want to diversify, that's an idea. Wow. So that's just, it's just classic cars. I mean, that doesn't even cover the breadth of the entire spectrum. That's just fascinating. So yeah. I had a follow up to that. So 25 year cycle, am, am I, am, am I hypothesizing this correctly in that 25 year cycle? Because Typically, when an individual is in that phase of where they see something cool, they're young, they're they're maybe still going through puberty, they're at the tail end of it, they're in their, their high teens in the college. Yep. So then, twenty five years that's prime money exactly. earning years. Okay. Yep. I see now so, why that's that's not necessarily speculative. I see where you're coming up across with the diversification there. Right. And then, so like, for example, the last few years when I've been at, I've gone to Gooding and Company, Arm Sotheby's, and I'm in there and I know those guys really well. Um, you know, I watch, you know, as a kid, you know, when I was, and I was a car kid, you know, I love cars. So I had posters of the Ferrari Testarossas and Lamborghini Diablos, and Lamborghini Pujash, you know, all surrounding my bedroom walls. So, and those are the cars right now that are just breaking the bank. Yeah, yeah, they're just absolutely going bonkers, um, you know. And you could have bought those cars more inexpensively five, six, seven, ten years ago. So the cycle might be fifteen years, and then you hold it for ten. Most time, we know Alex that someone's coming to you and saying, "Hey, I'm looking for a white, you know, Rolls Royce Phantom, <laughs> and funny. you know, with That's cream seats." Or, what's that? That's a funny example. I just we got a Rolls Royce coming in to the shop. Same thing. I've been working with this person for last four weeks and a Rolls Royce and we've got a bespoke Rolls Royce coming in like this week. So it's funny to use How that example did it take you to find that car hard. It's not easy. Hard. So, uh, yeah, it right again. And that's, that's a COVID situation. Just, it's not, there's not a lot of, so suppliers right now, 
you know, or shutting that, you know, shutting down with COVID issues or whatever it is. And then the manufacturers can't get the parts to make these cars. They, they, they can't, they can't supply the dealers enough cars. And that, that, that is a top down, bottom up problem. So yeah, it, it doesn't matter if it's a Honda Accord or if it's a Rolls Royce Cullinan, it's, it's the same problem. So even though most time, you know, it's, they're coming, I want this Jaguar F-Type, I want this, this Lamborghini. In the cases where you've mentioned someone comes up and says, you know, I'm thinking between these two somewhat, at least in their mind, like designed or built vehicles, how do you then help when they ask your opinion as to how you navigate what factors or how they determine what the right fit for them might be with a vehicle? Like, could you sure, maybe was, run through a process of what a conversation like that might look like? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, first, they might, you know, a lot of times if they, a lot of times I have referral business, it's a lot of referral business too. So this particular client, for say they, they've had, they bought three or four or six cars from me or something like that. And, and, and this is just another new foray into something new. And Rolls Royce is a good example to kind of start with. You don't really necessarily, well, I, and excuse the expression, but if, unless money is just dripping from everywhere, you don't really necessarily just want to go write a check for a Rolls Royce, okay? Because they because they do drop in value quite ra- rapidly. So and you, just, you just want to give it away, just give it away. You know, you, you don't care. You just want to own it. Just own it. You, you, but but a five hundred forty five thousand dollars Rolls Royce is probably going to be worth half of that in a year and a half. So, so it's, it just, that's just the facts and, and they won't give you a deal there either just because you can't get them. So they're, mm-hmm. they wave to you, they make, treat you, treat you mm-hmm. like fine wine and you take care of you and they, you know, and they, you, you feel like you did great when you walk out, but that thing's worth half when, <laughs> when you, you know, in about 18 months. So I recommend on that case, leasing that car. Um, and that, that way you're just looking at it as an expense. Um, and your managed expense, you know what it is, you know what you're willing to pay. It, you know, it, there's no question marks. And, and then you just roll with it that way. No pun intended. Uh, you know, the, um, that's kind of what I recommend in that situation. When it comes down to when you're talking fiscally, when you're talking about the car itself and the, whatever it's the personality of the car, whether it's the colors or if it's equipment, I'll let them know if they are concerned about it. I'll ask them if they're concerned about it. Are you concerned about what the value of this car is going to be and back off the Rolls Royce or something, just on something else? Yeah, then I'll, you know, are you concerned? How long are you going to keep the car? You know, is it uh, what some, some people still keep cars a long time. So it really doesn't matter um, from a value standpoint. Then the colors, you know, if the color, if you like the color, that's all that matters. I tell people that all the time. I mean, people, people get too wrapped up in that, you know, and, and we, and I live in it in Madison. People are just like, okay, black, silver, white, whatever, yada, yada, yada. You know, if, hey, if you like it and if it's your personality, go for it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, you know, you're only on the planet so long. Easy for me to say, I, I do, you know, I drive wild cars all the time. It's not, you know, and I don't really care. And, but people know I'm in the business. So people kind of expect it. I guess if you're rolling up and your neighbor's looking at you sideways and you don't want to feel like that, then I guess you would take a different approach. And I would rec, you know, and then, I, then I would just counsel them on that. A uh, follow-up question was you mentioned a, a little while back about, you don't think that, th- that cars are as, th- there aren't as many car enthusiasts as there once were. And I was just curious if you happen to know, just in speaking to your customers or potential customers uh, who may have a passing interest, but then they decide to go elsewhere and buy something else. Do you have an idea of what that next, is there a next thing? Is there, is there something other than cars and collectible classical cars that um, is now of interest? And please, please don't say NFTs. Please don't say NFTs. I'm begging you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah um you know i don't know what that next you know yeah yeah i don't i just i don't know what that next class that collectible thing is you know i yeah it's uh yeah i kind of try to look for it every day and see what the next big thing is I, I you know i'm looking at what's important 
to millennials and beyond right now. And I, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's hard for me to put my finger on it. I think it's experiences, you know, and I, you know, honestly, I think if you're in a, some sort of an experience related thing, and I don't necessarily think it's a, and we're getting off top, off car topic, but uh, you know, I, I don't think it's crowd-based experiences. <laughs> I think it's per, just personal. Uh, I don't know if it's travel. I think this COVID thing will definitely change that. I think, I think once the world can finally hopefully open up again, people are going to want to have, have experiences. Yeah. And that, that can be a car thing. I mean, I will say this, the car, this has really blown up the car business. It's, and I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, it's, it, it literally has been busier than you would believe um, the, in the last 12 months. Where, where I see it rhyming actually too, is we, is if we're talking about experiences and cars, a different experience, a couple of years ago, we were seeing, we started to see automakers produce um, an experience, right? Where you can have a subscription-based um, uh, vehicle service, right? Where you can drive if you want. I think Cadillac was maybe one of the first people that we were familiar, first companies yep. to offer this, but you know, you can drive an Escalade and next week you can turn that Escalade back in and pick up, uh, you know, a convertible or something like that. Um, what, what, what has your experience been with a service like that? And, and does, does that speak to some of these new experiences that maybe could be out there? What, what's your overall opinion on that kind of service? Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I remember when that first came out and you're, I think you're right, you're right on the point there with Cadillac. And I, I think that if somebody doesn't know what they actually want and they, and they want it, that's a great way of going about it. Um, I think the business model gets a little dicey, a little bit tricky, uh, you know, because there's a lot of things back end wise that I, you know, that I would be concerned with, with regard to that. So if I'm a, if I'm running uh, with dealership, which again, we can talk about that in a second, because those dealerships I think are going to be more thinned out. But uh, if you're, you know, there's maintenance costs to that vehicle, um, not from the cost of the subscriber necessarily, or it will eventually get back to them, but you know, somebody has that part and goes out on a binger on it or whatever, and it comes back trashed. And, you know, then it's just, you, then, then it goes to the next person um, that looks at it like, well, this isn't a good experience. It's car is trashed, you know, and, you know, and it, or it's it, it not, you know, not the standard that I want to experience there. I think there will be a lot more of that in the future. And I think that will be figured out. So Alex, I'm curious, you mentioned it just briefly, but I'd love to hear you elaborate further on it. What do you mean by thinning out of the dealers? Let's, let's talk a little bit about well, that. Well, I think uh, dealers are going to become, well, it's my feeling on this. There's a, now, you know, Tesla started this back when they came, you know, about, you know, Tesla's, you know, a direct to, from manufacturer consumer type business. Interestingly enough, that's illegal in some states, including Wisconsin. Uh, that's why they sell a lot of it. That's like if you look at Tesla registrations, there are a lot of sold out of California because, well, it's mm-hmm. directly from California to Wisconsin. So, um, but I think manufacturers are learning from that business model, and and it's definitely they're putting the pinch on dealers. Uh, it's it's hard to be a car dealer and uh, you know you know manufacturer and I'm talking from a franchise car dealer not what I'm doing. Um, mine's I'm a service based car dealership I, I I would call it that, and I do own my own inventory but I also do a lot of consignment vehicles, um, and uh, and I do offer a lot of services, but from a mainstream like BMW or, or Land Rover or Jaguar you know it it's they currently manufacturers need those dealer points to get their cars to the public. However, if you look at things like these new electric vehicles and things are, that are coming online right now, so that's a whole nother matter. So Volkswagen, for example, is gonna be a ton of electric vehicles. Many just announced that by 2025, I think they're gonna be 100% electric vehicles. So as these new products come on board, there's a, they're using this reservation-based system 
Um, for example, the Ford Bronco, the current the Ford Bronco that we've been talking about for years, okay, it's still not here yet. I mean, the little sport thing is, but yeah, you know, the real Ford Bronco is not here yet. So, but they use, you know, get online, check it out, get excited, put a hype video out and give us a hundred bucks and we'll reserve your spot. You know, well, how many hundred dollar deposits did those manufacturers take? You know, it drives a dealer's nuts because, you know, anybody can put a hundred dollars down on the car. That's $60,000, you know, and, you know, and then how many of those are really going to come to fruition as transactions? So, you know, a small percentage. So, but anyway, that that model is happening. I mean, I just I, honestly, I just bought a new electric Volkswagen or put an order in for my wife, not that long ago, because um, she wanted one. And uh, we'd started with a hundred dollar reservation a couple months ago, and now I had to give them another four hundred bucks because uh, we actually got a allocation of her vehicle, and it'll be here between October and December. And and quite honestly, uh, he was going to the dealership and they flipped me the keys. So. It is not a lot of service going on there. So, and there's not a, you know, you know, it's kind of basically how it's, it's going to be like buying an Apple iPhone. Is there a discount when you go buy that? Not so much. It's going to be just what car do you want? Order off the menu, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Just make it easy and let me get it, get what I want. I want my car yeah. and I want it now. Yeah. <laughs> vending machine. Yeah. They have vending machines in Japan and China and all kind of car vending machines actually. Uh, Carvana tried that thing here and it, it kind of worked. Mini actually had it for a while too. But yeah. So Alex, if someone's looking to come and buy an exotic or a classic car, something that's more on the high end, I mean, what do you, what do they, what should they expect from a purchase price standpoint, which it sounds like a lot of your clients are mostly doing the research. So they probably understand that, but I'm more curious about like other fees or the cost of ownership of such a car, like a Rolls Royce. What's the oil change on that thing? What if the tires go out? I mean, what are the overall fees just to maintain such a high level vehicle storage? I think off the top sure. of my head. A lot of that stuff does vary, you know, um, like for example, I've got storage available at my, my place. So I store a few people's vehicles there and it, that does vary. I've seen it from, uh, there's a place called Auto Vault over in um, Scottsdale, good guys down there. Um, beautiful facility and they've got several million million dollar plus cars in that facility it's a facility that can house hundreds of cars and uh, I think they charge anywhere from five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month to store your car in that place depending on where you what location in the facility you want it I'm very less uh, high profile so uh, you know I'm at like the 250 range per month um, to store a vehicle with me and I have limited spots um, from a storage standpoint, and then it's the services that come along with that you want to think about. Okay, what is what do you get? You know, we we want, you know make sure your car is dusted off, cleaned up, started up, charged. You know, you got to plug the car in. Get some of these cars, like McLarens, you got to treat them like an iPhone. You got to plug them in. If you don't plug them in when you're not using them, you're going to have maintenance problems. So so there is there's things like that to keep in mind. Uh, to, to to service these cars, yeah, they typically run. You know, so, so if you're going from like a, a Honda, Toyota, uh, Nissan to a BMW, Mercedes, Audi, I, I would say that you're, you know, you're going to run 20% higher service uh, than you're used to uh, in general. If you're going to run to Ferraris, what I'm out, if you're talking about, and I'm talking modern day cars here, late, late model cars, um, believe it, Ferrari's got seven years maintenance paid. So uh, you buy a Ferrari set for seven years, your mate, they pay your maintenance and they, you, don't, you don't have any fees other than tires. Cause if you're going to be Ronnie Rabbit, you're going to go to tires, you know, those types of things you have to pay for, but, uh, but oil changes, annual services. Now, what we find here in our little pocket of the world is, you know, the closest Ferrari dealer is, you know, two and a half hours away. Sometimes getting into a service appointment takes a, you know, weeks. Sometimes your car's got to be there for a week. Then you got to ship it down there, ship it back. There's expense involved in the shipping. Um, there's all kinds of that going. And that's where I come into play because it, it, people just want to deal with it. They'd rather pay me 800 bucks to service their car every year. Too. So, so that's kind of, and then they can get their car back in a day and enjoy it. You just have to know that things are just going to go, you know, it, it, right wrong reason it could be the nicest one on the planet 
grandma drove it, put it away, maintenance it on a regular basis. You could own that car for 10 years and not do a thing to it and drive it a couple hundred miles a year, a thousand miles a year, not have to do anything but change the oil every once in a while, check on everything on it, make sure there's air in the tires and enjoy it. You could have the same car you know, just by age, things just go, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. It, so you just have to be thick skinned when it comes to those types of things. I tell people that all the time, you know, when they come, especially when they're buying their first kind of pseudo classic or classic vehicle, it's like, hey, are you, if you, your first time foray into this, you do have to know that you know, you're buying a 25 year old car, things are going to break and it could happen. And I, and I can't do anything. I can't, you know, you know, I, you have to understand that I'm selling this to you with the understanding and knowledge that, you know, things could happen. Yeah. Yeah. Things can break. Just, yeah. Be aware. Yeah. Buyer beware. Okay. So um, one of my last questions, and I'm curious, you know, could you talk a little bit about limited release, the re- limited release arena and how an individual can even get in a slot for a limited release? And can you get them in a slot? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh give me an example do you have an example of a oh. car that dan I'm, I'm gonna throw that into you i i'm <laughs> you probably know better than i do um like i like i know ferrari has done that before in the past they only make so many of a particular model and my understanding of this is uh and and the three of us none of the three of us are the the real car expert inside the firm but my understanding of that from that expert inside the firm is that uh, that's not so easy to get on that list to be able to take a shot at that vehicle to begin with. Like they might be looking at someone who has bought several Ferraris to even have a shot at that vehicle. Yeah. So, okay. So th- he's right. Or whoever that person is pretty, pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. And that used to be um, when it came to any kind of Ferrari sports car, um, even the, even there's nothing mainstream about a Ferrari, but the current F8, which would be replaced the 488 or, you know, you know, those types of vehicles where the people that are long-term Ferrari owners or many Ferrari that have owned many Ferraris or still own many Ferraris, they are going to go to the top of the list. Okay. And a lot of times you have to kind of cut your teeth on something else that's they're They're not selling as, that isn't selling as hot. So, so, if you, you might have to go buy a Portofino or you might have to buy a California back in the day to get and then own it for a year and say, Hey, I want a 488. And then, okay, okay. We'll sell you a 488. And then you can go buy that. And then, then, okay. Well then you can buy, and if you want the really special stuff, you probably have to own six or seven Ferraris. Yeah. Or you gotta be one of the, like, if you want a Monza or you want something like that coming out of the factory, if you, yeah, you just get, or you could be up to be celebrity status. I mean, celebrity status helps. So, but they, they do blackball people too. They, they absolutely do. If you, if you have your, if you, and it doesn't matter who you are, uh, you could be Tom Hanks and you go grab, you, you get the special Ferrari and you go get that thing and you turn the interior pink. They will not sell you another Ferrari. Yeah. They will not, they don't care who you are. They will not, they do not like that. I and mean, I do have some relationships out there that I can, you know, and I bought enough cars that I can usually get higher on a list. Um, can I get to the first one? Not necessarily. So before we, before we close up our podcast and I'll let Dan start with the final thoughts, but I have one last question. And this one's directly for you. If you could own any I car, ask this all the time. <laughs> what would it be this is like the, this is a, this is a, this is a question i've been used to for about for 20 years probably um and it's not a very interesting answer so but uh it's because i've been really really very fortunate when it comes if you're car if you're a car person i've been very fortunate i've got, had an opportunity to drive a lot of cars and own a ton of cars personally and i there is no one car for me anymore there used to be you asked me 10 15 20 years ago maybe but i've owned them so or pretty much i mean i've owned them yeah, except for something that's got provenance okay uh, you know a car in a car collection that would be that might be significant and get me excited 
uh, for me, it's much about the story. Is is about it with no situations. This is, is about the car itself. So if the car comes with a cool story, um, there's a cool back history, and it. it doesn't even have to be famous story for me. I mean, it can be. It could be. Uh, a, a couple years ago, I ran across a really cool Corvette. I'm not a Corvette guy. Don't like them at all. Um, and uh, in fact, I kind of really don't like Corvette. But but it, but it's uh, uh, this guy bought this thing new um spent his life wrenching on his car passed away you know like five years ago family kept the car in the garage wife kept it there um it was their pride you know the pride his pride and joy so it was his thing and that thing was chipped weathered she had said i sat at her kitchen table and she told me stories for two three hours on that car how they had moved to San Diego, the night Marilyn Man- or whatever, the Los Angeles or Los Angeles when Marilyn Manson killed people that night. They moved there. They were they moved in that night and they drove up in that car in that in that area. And that there was a hitting news story. And she told me stories about the convertible top being down and going through the you know Death Valley at a hundred and some odd degrees outside. And, you know, they're, they're just cool stories. And that, that went along with this weathered corvette it was just weather beaten checked and everything else and everything was original on it and it was it, i thought man that's just cool it wasn't expensive it was just cool so that gets me excited um i'm not answering your question my day to day is what am i am i tired if it's been a long day do i just want to get in something and put it in drive and go and then i'll, I'll find whatever the easiest closest thing is if it's friday and I'm ready to knock off at three o'clock in the afternoon and it's beautiful 72 degrees outside. And I want to, I want to shift through some gears. Um, or if I want to listen to a 12 cylinder howl, I'll jump in that and go. So, uh, so that's kind of where I'm at in my life, but owning, um, you know, um, I love to own a story, you know, that's kind of, that, you know, that's, that's kind of how it, that's what works for me. I think that's an answer. Um, you know, it's funny too. It's kind of been a theme we've had on, on the last number of podcasts we have is the the story or the history providing so much of the value. We had a close friend of mine come talk about fine art and valuing fine art. And, uh, you know, he was hitting on how the history, we know that you, that you have in our background too, the history of that as to what, you know, what driving the price of the art um, sounds like sounds like that's a factor in with your story as, as well too. Um, so, I mean, I, I've learned a lot uh, to list them off. I mean, one of which is we all have wild times in our lives, right? Uh, and hopefully all of us grow out of it. I don't know if everybody does, but, yeah. but I should think most people do, right? Um, don't try to go negotiate a steak at Ruth's Chris because that's not going to get you very far. <laughs> you might see some more in the, the car industry. And Tom Hanks, if you're listening, you better change your mind about making that in, that internal interior of that car pink. That's a bad idea. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but you know, when it really comes down to it, I think the big takeaway for me that you mentioned a number of times, um, and of course, I say this with the thought of as long as it's sustainable so you can keep the car, is, uh, is buy what you really like. You know, if, if that color happens to be pink, the pink exterior, but it fits you and that, and that tells who you are and portrays it. And that's important to you. Then stop caring about what people think and go get the pink car. Um, You know, really, really make that your story, right? That car part of it. Uh, You've mentioned that in a couple different fashions. I think that's really great advice. If you're going to be spending something on an asset that indeed very well may drop in value, make sure you really enjoy it and love it and, and make that your primary factor. And at some point next time, when I talk to you personally, I'd love to get your thoughts as to why you really dislike Corvettes, but we can leave that for another time. I'll, yeah. I'll pass it to him. Yeah, Alex, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. My final thoughts, um, I think I, I'll go based off the last question and I'm going to take that because I love the qualitative nature of your answer. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, you know, things cost a lot of money or they can appreciate, but the vast majority of the time people appreciate the story. People appreciate what it does, the experience. You know, we talked a little bit about that with millennials, but it's just more of what it can tell. Uh, That's what provides an art piece is what's behind it. And I think 
you know, I'll give a shout out to our, our team member, Darren. He's the one that's the car enthusiast. And he took me down to a car show in Milwaukee and we got in cars together and I have never experienced a car until he started explaining it to me. Like, can you hear that? You can't hear people the way that it feels, the way that you touch it, the way that it moves. And he, he views cars as an art form. I just don't view it that way. And it really opened up my eyes that some people really see this as something more than just a vehicle. And um, it really made me appreciate cars more from a different angle, but it was all about the qualitative, right? It's not the quantitative. It's not about just trying to make money. It's about the story. It's about the feel. It's about who you are. The, if it's pink, it's pink. Um, and I think Dan hit it on the head. If it's pink and it's you, yeah. then do it. Stop worrying about whatever right. else thinks. Nathaniel. Uh, I'll be short and sweet. I, I just like the, the fact that every, every customer is different. So uh, being able to, to service that person in all of the facets that is within your business, I think takes a unique skill set, and not many people can replicate that. From, so from a, if I were to analyze your business, I can definitely see where that value is that you provide to your, to your clients. So with that, Alex, your last words. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's, that's been the goal that, you know, that was the goal when I decided to leave the mainstream franchised car business and running large scale car dealerships was, was to be more personal, be uh, more available. And that that's on both ends. That's on, that's on a, you know, if I'm trying to procure a car, help you dispose of a vehicle, um, or somebody from the other end operating from the other direction, trying to obtain that vehicle. So, um, and cut out the levels. That's, I when I started this business, I told myself none of that was going to be what I do. So we do use third-party sites to market cars. So, but when people do call in, that's connected to my cell phone. I can't tell you a general manager in the country that's crazy enough to do that. So, um, and that's what makes me different. And that's what, uh, how I, the success that I've had, um, you know, have all of it that I need is because of that. And there's not enough of that in the world, let alone the car business. So. Very well said. We, we could agree more with that. And we appreciate and value the customization that you bring the field, you know, to, to your industry for, uh, a, a number of our clients, but so many other people as well, too. So thank you for, for doing that. And Alex, thanks also for taking time out and, and providing this level of education to our audience. It's very insightful. We, we very much appreciate it. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this ride tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time.